few words on uh, the TRA-6. TRA stands for Transdisciplinary Research Area. We have six of them at the, at the University of, Bo of Bonn. And this one is called Innovation Technology for Sustainable Futures. I could tell you a lot about this, but I don't want to. I want to give Jessica uh, the maximum time possible for her lecture. If you want to know, no, no, know more, please visit um, the Unibond Research Profile website where you can read more about what TRI 6 is about. This lecture series, uh, we thought of uh, a forum for high profile internationally visible scientists who are active in academia or at the science policy interface to give them a voice and uh, talk to us, inspire us uh, in our uh, yeah, quest to develop and implement a research agenda on sustainability science. And uh, today we're in fact delighted that uh, Jessica Fanzo has agreed to give the first virtual lecture in this series. Jessica is a Blomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food Policy and Ethics at the Berman Institute of Bioethics and the Blomberg School of Public Health and the Nitze School of Advanced International Studies at the Johns Hopkins University. All of us know the Johns Hopkins University since uh, the corona pandemic starts because there you find all the statistics. Jessica also serves as, as the director of the Hopkins Global Food Policy and Ethics Program and is director of food and nutrition security at the John Hopkins University Alliance for a Healthier World. And she is editor in chief for the Global Food Security Journal and leads on the development in collaboration with GAIN of the Food Systems Dashboard. Um, she has also uh, held several positions uh, at universities and international research institutions before coming and uh, I could tell you much more about what she's done, but I think she will do that as well. You should just know that uh, she has done a lot of work in many parts of the world on the linkages between agriculture and environment and climate and health to improve food systems and environments. Uh, she has done a lot of work on the importance of regaining food security and agricultural based livelihoods in post conflict regions and also on the emerging area of equitable, ethical, and sustainable diets and food systems. Uh, with this, I'd like to keep it short and pass the word over to Jessica. Jessica, are you still with us? Hopefully you are. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> okay, so um, the sh your, your screen is shared and the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Jan and uh, Professor Von Braun for inviting me to do this lecture. It's a real pleasure to um, at least see you all online. It's unfortunate we can't uh, see each other in person. And, and also thanks to Hannah for helping organize. So I'm going to talk today about sustainable food systems in a very strange time that we're living in. That we're living in the midst of the Anthropocene. We're living in the middle of a pandemic. And the question is, is can we have it all? Can we have sustainable food systems for human and planetary health? So just to highlight what I'll talk about, I'm first going to walk us through food systems and, and how are they faring? How are they coping in the context of all of these grand challenges? And I'm particularly going to focus on climate change, global malnutrition, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I'll, I'll turn to four areas of, of where I think there's still uh, a need for improvement, there's a need for, for some pausing and thinking about how to do these things better. One is research and science, one is technology, innovation, government action, and then I'll touch a bit on behaviors of consumers, but also behaviors of all food system actors. And then just end on trade-offs as we move forward. So there's been a lot of calls for food system transformation. In the last five years, we've seen many reports published calling for uh, the idea that food systems are unsustainable, they're not working well, they're not meeting their outcomes of economic growth, health for humans, health for the planet, as well as um, social cohesion and social justice. So there's been many calls, particularly to fix food systems for diets and nutrition. And I've, I've put some of those up here. And in the last couple of years, layered on top of that have been a slew of reports calling not only for improving human health through diets and nutrition, but planetary health as well. Um, 
And, and I think some of you know some of these reports, the Eat Lancet on Commission report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, and Land report, and one that I really liked, but it was uh, 900 pages, was the World Resources Report of Creating a Sustainable Food Future. But making this grand transformation of food systems is not so easy with the challenges that the food system faces. We're dealing with not only climate disruption, worsening food insecurity and malnutrition, and now this COVID pandemic, but many other challenges, of course, still extreme poverty, uh, competition for land, uh, biofuels, uh, food aid issues, trade issues, um, the list goes on and on, and I actually had a long list that didn't fit on a slide, but food systems are facing so many challenges and so many debates, but also, you know, food systems have become quite incredibly resilient. So the question is, is can the world expect so much from food systems as we enter these more uncertain times? So just to, to walk us through some of these big challenges. Well, the Anthropocene is defined as Earth's most geological time period, which is human influenced. Never has there been a time where uh, humans have altered so many different systems, whether it be atmospheric, geological, hydrological, and other Earth system processes. We are creating the biggest footprint across the globe. And this Anthropocene has been described many times, Paul Crutzen and others have, have defined this time period. And there's been many uh, papers coming out on uh, this uh, Anthropocene era that we are living in, or you often see Absolutely. terms like the sixth mass extinction. Um, and so there's been a lot of, of, of reading and, and writing about this Anthropocene. Um, there's even a journal called Anthropocene. <laughs> um, and what we're really seeing is a significant impact of, of human-induced climate change. And most countries, most governments in the world believe that humans are the biggest driver of the warming of the planet with the exception of really one country, that being the United States, which unfortunately is, is pulling out of the Paris Accord uh, Agreement right one day after the United States election, which is incredibly unfortunate for not only the United States, but for the world. But we know that the world is warming um, and this IPCC quote, the challenge of avoiding catastrophic climate breakdown requires rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. This is a very alarming quote, but one that holds true. And if we really want to mitigate and stop climate change in its tracks, everything needs to change. So, so we're really in, a, in a, a moment of time where the clock is ticking. And food systems are both victims and instigators of climate change. So here is a, a diagram that we developed uh, when I was leading the high level panel of experts nutrition and food systems report that just geographically depicts food systems. I like this diagram, although it's not, it's a little bit confusing with all the boxes and arrows because it articulates the complexity of food systems. If you look to the left, you've got food supply chains, that's food that's produced, it's stored, it's processed, it's packaged, it hits markets. It then enters the food environment space, the place where you as a consumer walk into a market or restaurant and you make decisions. You bring with yourself your individual factors, your knowledge, your aspirations, your willingness to pay for certain things. But that food environment also shapes your decisions. What's available? Is the food affordable? What are the product properties, the quality, the safety? What are the vendor properties? What's the store like? How far do you have to travel to get to that store? What's the advertising and promotion and branding of those foods? All of those 
factors are shaping consumers' decisions, some in beneficial ways and some in very perverse ways. This, of course, influences diets, nutrition and health outcomes, as well as economic and environmental outcomes of food systems. Along the top are drivers, external to the food system or exogenous to the food system, but highly influencing the food system in positive and negative ways. Urbanization, migration, climate change, trade, globalization, etc., population growth, politics. These are all influencing and shaping and shifting dynamic food systems. And you know, we all know that food systems are not static. They're constantly changing and being influenced by these different drivers. Well, climate change is a real threat to food security. This is a, a graph showing you, two graphs showing you the population at risk for hunger on the left and the dietary energy available in kcals per person per day under different climate change scenarios, with uh, green being the optimal scenario of climate change into the future, and red being the worst case scenario. And you can see that uh, in the worst case scenario, in a more somewhat worse than business as usual, but somewhere in between, uh, you see that more people will be at risk of, of, of hunger and, and energy available uh, per capita will decline. So it is a climate change is and will continue to be a threat to food security. Well, why is that? Well, there's many reasons, but uh, we know that models suggest that a three degree warmer, and I say scarier world scenario will lead to significant uh, declines in crop yields in much of the southern hemisphere. Um, in some places like Canada and Russia and will have bumper crops, but many places will experience stress, whether it be water stress, uh, biodiversity loss, which will significant as uh, you know, soil erosion, many different uh, issues related to the ability to grow food that will impact crop yields. There's also a lot of work happening around these multiple bread basket failures, climate related extreme weather events like droughts, floods, heat waves, cold spells can really impact uh, the ability for crops to yield at their full potential. And there is uh, modeling to suggest that we're going to see multiple bread basket failures uh, resulting in potential uh, food insecurity because of the climate change. So this is a very scary proposition, but one that is potentially very real. Another issue with climate change is this area that Sam Myers and other colleagues at Harvard have been looking at, um, looking at the nutritional quality of crops under a CO2 fertilization effect. And they found that with some crops, some essential key nutrients are being lost under a CO2 fertilization effect. So things like zinc, iron, protein would be declining in wheat, rice, soybeans, maize, some of the major staple crops in the world that people consume. Um, the nutritional quality of those would decline and that puts us at more significant risk for protein and, and micronutrient deficiencies. And safety risks will change with warmer climates. So this is a graph showing you uh, Western Europe of aflatoxin contamination in maize. On the left is at present uh, uh, conditions, a two degree world and then a, a catastrophic five degree world where the red is showing you aflatoxin contamination. So you can see in warmer climates, aflatoxin does better. And of course, aflatoxin not only is a cause of liver cancer, but it has been argued that it is associated with stunting among children under the age of five. So the, the, the change of pathogens with warmer climates um, will also be something that will, will have to be looked at. And of course, we can also think about uh, zoonotic disease in that category as well. Food systems also contribute to 
climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. We know that about 40% of the Earth's land is used to grow food. And that's showing you on the left. And of that land being used, agriculture, you see different measures, somewhere between 11 to 25% uh, contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that comes not only from ruminant enteric fermentation in which cows are, are burping methane um, and the waste coming from, from ruminants, but that's also the energy uh, uh, fertilizers, methane uh, produced from rice. It's the whole agriculture system that is a contributor to greenhouse gases. So um, obviously most of, of countries are looking at their transportation and energy sectors. Uh, more and more agriculture is also being looked at as its contribution of greenhouse gases, particularly the very toxic methane gases. And if we continue on a, a, a normal trajectory, food production in its current state puts, is putting pretty significant environmental stress. And it's doing that in order to meet the growing dietary demands. So this is showing you five different environmental indicators looking by food product and the two bars um, for each environmental indicator is 2010 levels or present day and projecting out in a business as usual 2050. And you can see that animal products are significant contributors to greenhouse gases. But when you look at the other animal, uh, sorry, the other food groups like fruits and vegetables, staples are shown in blue, fruits and vegetables in green, um, uh, legumes in brown, you can see that other foods, depending on their life cycle of how they're grown, where they're grown and by whom, can have different environmental impacts. So uh, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds can have quite a significant water footprint, for example. Um, nitrogen and, and phosphorus application also uh, is, uh, puts, is stressed by fruits and vegetables and staple grains. But we have to also note that many of these staples, roughly 50 to 65% of these staples grown are being fed to animals that we then consume. So the animal story and the amount of animals we produce in the world to meet that dietary demand is definitely putting stress on multiple environmental indicators. Now the Eat Lancet Commission, which I was a part of, and I'm happy to talk about the politics of that, which were significant. I'm not sure if I'll ever be on a commission again like that. Um, it called for grand transformations to food production systems. And they modeled something called the healthy reference diet or the planetary health diet. If you look at this graph, the yellow is showing you by 2050 in a business as usual, nothing changes to address climate change and we keep wasting the amount of food we do now, that's shown in yellow. In green is if everyone ate the Eat Lancet recommended healthy diet, which is a very plant-based uh, or flexitarian type diet, and we cut food waste in half is shown in green. And if you look at what would need to change in the food production systems. So in 2050, if we everyone ate that that plant-based diet, no increase in cereal production. That means that the entire agriculture system would need to change. It very much emphasizes cereal production. Vegetables and fruits would need to go up 75 and 50%. In a recent paper by Mario Herrero and Daniel uh, Masson de Croix showed that already, if everyone were to eat the recommended vegetables and fruit intake per day, which is 400 grams, we currently don't even produce enough fruits and vegetables to meet that demand. So you can imagine under climate stress how difficult that would be. Fish, 50% increase, that means more sustainable aquaculture. We've stocked out our wild resources of, of, of seafood. Legumes, 75%. Nuts, 150%. Very difficult to do. We don't have the varieties to meet the caloric demands of those two foods. 
And this was the most controversial piece of the Eat Lancet. Red meat production, we need to come down 65%. So this very much hits the livestock sector, ranchers very hard and their livelihoods. And that was a significant political controversy of the Eat Lancet. But how would we even get to this kind of production system when the world is moving more towards diets that are similar? The food supply composition from the 1960s to now has become much more homogenized. We're growing more of fewer crops. And this was work done by SEAT, the CGIR, Colin Curry. And also, on the right is showing you what we currently produce, which is mainly cereals and starches, oils and sugars, and the United States subsidy policies, for example, promote this type of food production system. Whereas the, the healthy plate has much more fruits and vegetables, less cereals and starches, um, some animal source foods. So what we are producing and the subsidy systems of, of large countries and large agriculture producing countries do not align with the dietary guidelines and what constitutes a healthy diet. So getting to that Eat Lancet recommendation right now is out of reach for the agriculture system as it stands. So let's talk about malnutrition and food insecurity. Well, the malnutrition burden is massive and it's complex. We have 690 million people who are going to bed hungry and that number has been increasing over the last several years. We have 144 uh, million children who are stunted or chronically undernourished. That's about 25% of the world's children. 50 million children who are acutely malnourished. That number really hasn't changed. And 2.1 billion adults who are overweight and obese. And we're seeing a double burden that is the undernutrition and the overweight and obesity. Countries are grappling with both of those double burdens, even triple burdens if you add micronutrient deficiencies. And Barry Popkin and colleagues showed that in the 1990s, um, there was a significant amount of double burden uh, around the world. Um, but that's really shifted now to low and middle income countries. So low income countries that are grappling with you know, scarce resources are, are now dealing with a very complex burden of both undernutrition and overweight and obesity as these countries economically transition and become more urbanized. So we have this massive paradox now where you still have people in the world, and this is the Abubakar family, they're in a refugee camp in Chad. They spend a dollar a week on their food. Most of this is food aid. And then you have another family in the United States, in North Carolina. They spend $300 a week on food. And look at just the differences in the types of foods. One could argue that neither is sufficient to meet what is considered a healthy and sustainable diet. But the inequities uh, are significant. There's a lot of inequities for African-American families in the United States, as I'm sure a lot of you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, the structural racism of the US and what families can afford in the US, but you also have still people worried about going to bed hungry every single day. Diets are now one of the biggest contributors, the biggest contributor to malnutrition, that complex malnutrition that I showed, but they're also the top risk factor for overall global disease and death. And this was some work we published with the Global Burden of Disease led by uh, Ashkan Afshin, showing that dietary risks more than tobacco, more than air pollution is the top risk factor for death. And it's these suboptimal diets that are the biggest contributors. Diets high in sodium, diets that are not uh, consistent with enough whole grains, enough fruits, enough veg, enough nuts and seeds. So these suboptimal diets are contributing to roughly 11 million deaths annually. So 
It is ironic that diets, which is meant to nourish us, is now killing us. And it really puts kind of the die, D-I-E, in diets, <laughs> in a sense. Um, the Eat Lancet Commission really shows some of these inequities, though, in suboptimal diets. So that Eat Lancet planetary health diet is this orange dotted ring. And when you look globally at what people are eating around the world, people are eating a lot of red meat and a lot of starchy staples and a lot of eggs and not enough of the good stuff, the fruits, the veg, the nuts and seeds. They don't even get to the, to the recommended health boundary. Here's the United States, essentially. We consume a lot of meat and a lot of potatoes, meat and potato culture. But look at how much we're going way beyond what is necessary uh, for human health to the point of being at risk for cardiovascular disease and colon cancer and other uh, significant um, detriments to human health when consuming too much red meat. Here's South Asia. Not enough of the good stuff, but enough on starches. And here's Sub-Saharan Africa. Not enough of the good stuff, a lot of starchy staples. When you look at these four, or even three, North America, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, look at the inequities in these diets. Who gets access to what? But what it shows is that no matter where people are, people are not eating enough of the good stuff. And even taking the equity issue further, the Eat Lancet diet is unaffordable for 1.6 billion people. That plant-based diet recommended in the Eat Lancet is just unattainable for so many. And that's shown in the green bars across global income categorization of countries and regions. The blue bar is just a nutrient adequate diet, not even the Eat Lancet diet. Do people meet their basic nutrient needs? And for many, people cannot even afford that. But that healthier plant-based diet is unaffordable. And the SOFI report talked, uh, this year's FAO SOFI report, which I found outstanding, really goes into the cost of a healthy diet. And they show that while many people can afford an energy sufficient diet shown in the left. Most people all over the world, in every country, in every city who tend to be poor cannot afford a healthy diet. So that's even here where I live in Washington, DC. And these energy intensive lifestyles and dietary choices of those living in high income countries of those who have wealth often are anthropogenic contributors to climate change. And they will not suffer the consequences of their choices. Poor households, poor communities will experience a disproportionate burden of the impacts of those diets with climate change. And that's completely unjust and of course very unfair. Um, and uh, these unhealthy diets, uh, or sorry, these unaffordable healthy diets really correlate nicely with food insecurity and malnutrition. This is again from this year's SOFI report showing prevalence of undernutrition in the middle is child stunting and the, the right is obesity, showing that as the unaffordability of a healthy diet, diet correlates with uh, hunger uh, as well as stunting and, and obesity. And food prices can also lead to social unrest. If people cannot afford their basic diet, there's a strong correlation with social unrest. So if we think about climate change, and this is showing you red is a, a medium pre, a scenario of climate change, uh, and blue is no climate change, which will not happen. Climate change is happening. You see that basic commodity prices will go up. And we know that many households um, spend 50, 60, 70% of their entire income on food. So if food prices go up. There's a very fine line there. And we've seen that with certain uh, food price spikes, uh, the 2000 
uh, eight food price spike um, in the following 2010-2011 food price spike, there was a correlation with rising food-related protests and riots. You know, the, the idea of a hungry man as an angry man holds true. Um, this is not a good scenario when we think about pulling together the cost of diets, climate change, migration, social unrest. This is, this is not a good scenario for, for countries and they should deeply consider ensuring that everyone gets access to, to, to food and healthy diets. One, one project we're looking at is in uh, northeastern Kenya, looking at pastoralists who are under incredible stress, uh, climate change stress, the stress, land stress, and many of the tribes that are living up in those areas are at conflict with each other. And we've been trying to understand the constraints that hinder their abilities to secure uh, livelihoods. And many uh, of the pastoralists are, are undermined. They don't, their endowments, um, their political and social capital have been undermined and marginalized. And you see this all over the world of whether ethnic minorities, uh, a caste, a certain tribe, um, the color of your skin, uh, there's more and more um, transparency in seeing how these structural injustices are creating a marginalization of certain populations where they're denied opportunities and um, they're being left behind when we think about the sustainable development goals and creating a lot of conflict and, and um, this, is, this is a big issue uh, in the Horn of Africa that we've been studying for quite a while now. And even with the eat, plant, eat Lancet diet, if you think about the cost of that, when you add animal source foods, it would be even more expensive and more unattainable. This is work by Derek Hetty and Harold Alderman at IFPRI showing that the cost of animal source foods is incredibly expensive in low income and low and middle income countries. You can see the dark blue and the turquoise by income categorization. And a lot of that is due to you know, poor value chains, unstructured value chains, poor roads, a lack of uh, cold storage and the ability to carry perishable goods over bodies of water and roads. But um, the cost of foods is incredibly expensive. And there's a growing demand for meat all over the world, particularly Asia, um, we're seeing this this, this meat demand uh, grow. So what do we do? And just a quick side note, it's not just uh, meat that's the bad guy. Uh, highly processed foods or what's called ultra processed foods, which have been associated with poor outcomes are rising everywhere. When we look across regions, when we look across income categories, that's all of basically the junk food. Foods high in sugar, salt, and unhealthy fats they're rising everywhere because they're cheap, they're tasty, and they're very convenient. So what about COVID? Well, COVID began as a food system risk. We know that it, it happened through a zoonotic spillover event, event, most likely from a bat, but maybe through another animal. And case traced back, uh, back from December in Wuhan implicated a seafood wet food market. Um, where food, uh, wildlife, and other live animals are bought or sold for consumption. These, of course, are very risky places um, uh, from a, a pandemic preparedness perspective since stressed wild animals are brought together and encourage a pathogen to jump species. Um, it is, uh, COVID is a, a zoonosis. It's a disease that jumped from animals to humans. 60% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. And of that 60%, 72% originate in wildlife. So food and agriculture have a big part to play in the rise of zoonotic diseases. We as humans are, are shaping and shifting and have done uh, the planet and, and ecosystems in which species live. And a lot of that has to do with agriculture and deforestation. 
So we have shrunk the natural habitats or have destroyed na uh, these natural habitats where many species live, and we've put them in closer proximity to humans. So again, going back to the Anthropocene, no other species has so profoundly changed the planet and the ecosystems in such a short span of time. And I really highly recommend reading this New York Times Magazine article. It's just a fantastic read about this history of, of zoonotic disease. We can think about Ebola, West Nile, Zika, Rift Valley, AIDS, all related to uh, zoonotic diseases. And uh, IFPRI just came out with a, a, a nice report looking at uh, in real time COVID and global food security. And one of the biggest impacts of course of COVID is on, uh, on poverty and, and escalating poverty across the world in, in the, in the uh, significant global economic crisis that we're now seeing. Um, and one of the big issues in the food system is the formal jobs at risk, with many of those at risk being in the middle of the supply chain, the food processors, food services, distribution, transportation. And we're seeing that play out in the United States with uh, meat packaging, meat processing plants being significantly impacted. And now there's projections that uh, acute food insecurity will rise to 265 million by the end of 2020 due to the uh, economic upheaval um, and the inability to get food to where it needs to go. We're also seeing that malnutrition might be potentially impacted. A Lancet Global Health article showed that uh, because of the reduced coverage of basic maternal and child health services, there's going to be an uptick of 42,000 under five deaths uh, per month. Um, higher projections indicate potentially a million over the next year. So the impacts of COVID on overall health and malnutrition are significant. And this was a paper that just came out by Zulfi Bhutta and others showing that not only the economic issues, um, but interrupted social safety nets, um, overwhelmed health systems, will create a, a cascading events that contribute to more malnutrition um, because of the inability to get access to healthy diets and healthcare services and sanitation and hygiene. And they really recommend that um, we need more investment in services in the, in the immediate term and community-based systems, community health workers to keep at least preventative public health going during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I have a paper coming out in this, in this uh, COVID-19 a world order book that will be available for free from Johns Hopkins Press and, you, and the Muse Project. And I argue for these seven recommendations. One is to stabilize food systems and keep trade and open, uh, trade open and flowing. And of course that involves protecting and supporting food system workers. Um, but we need to be thinking um, longer term as well. How do we link social protection programs to nutritious and healthy diets? How do we think about a One Health approach for our research collaborations? Taking in climate, ecosystems, zoonotic diseases into account when we're doing our research. How do we institute a systemic global effort to monitor pathogens emerging from animals that put human populations at risk? The fact that the United States has turned their back on the WHO um, and support and funding for the WHO is quite catastrophic in the ability for WHO to do surveillance. Um, and it, it's quite a, a, you know, a, a show of how the US government stands on its uh, multilateral cooperation, which is incredibly unfortunate. And of course, we need to finance the Global Humanitarian Response Plan. It was set up, but there's not enough financing to carry it out at the moment. So should we expect so much from food systems? You know, a lot of models suggest that we can do it. Food systems can promote human health, ensure 
planetary help and provide equitable and fair livelihoods. But that's going to really depend on several things, many things. But I'm going to just focus on four areas, research, technology, governance, and behaviors. And this was a, a paper we just published two days ago, um, looking at uh, some of these issues in um, how to operationalize the Lancet Commission. So the first is building and communicating research and evidence. In, uh, as, a, as the editor for the Global Food Security Journal, we, we as the editors published a paper looking at the research vision. You know, right now, research and, and science and evidence is under incredible scrutiny and um, even disregarded. And this is a really crazy time to be in research because uh, many are doubting science and evidence, you know, not only governments, but business leaders. Um, but we as researchers and scientists must maintain our, our course and, and not be, um, you know, not be demoralized by some of these ideas because we know that research has a vital role in charting a positive and sustainable direction um, for global food security, nutrition, and health. And research can bring uh, wholesale changes in attitudes, political thought, and action. We've seen this with climate change. It took 40 years to get there, but we've seen that. So researchers must continue to generate evidence that can help speed progress in time to sustain planetary integrity and human development. It's so key. It's so key for us to, to continue on the course, um, even though many are, are, are doubtful. Um, but we need to sort ourselves out and align our messages. There's a lot of debate about how food systems should function. Some of it, not very helpful debate. You know, there's a lot of questions about how are we gonna feed the, feed the world? Um, this is a great paper by Chris Bene showing the different narratives that play out. There's those that um, feel that we need to just produce more food. There's those that feel that we need to produce more quality food. There's those that feel that we need to take a social justice approach and create more equitable benefits. And those that feel that the food system needs to in adjust to a more environmentally sustainable message. Well, we need all of it. It's not this or that. We need all of these things to happen. But you often see in the research, people get into their silos and their world views and their ideologies and it stymies progress and it stymies debate. We need to align ourselves on these issues. We also need to know and realize that evidence doesn't always matter in political decision making. I like this quote by Julius Court, the good news is that evidence can matter. The bad news is that it often does not. We have to also keep in mind that as policy, policymakers are making decisions, they're not just considering evidence, they're considering many other things and they're influenced by many other factors, values, resources, lobbyists, pressure groups, you know, experiences. And so opinion-based policy is often mixed with evidence-based policy. And so we need to um, consider as researchers that how does policy making and policy processes work? We don't often engage ourselves with political decision making, but we need to understand how it works and engage. Um, we need to reject the romantic notion that policymakers will ever think like scientists. They're not gonna read our papers that are in peer review journals. It just doesn't work that way. Um, they make decisions quickly with limited evidence limited information. They often have to do that. They're not going to wait for us to say more research is needed. So we need as researchers to engage in the political decision making processes. On technology, it's an incredible time that we're in. There's never been uh, a time where we've seen so much on social media, communications, technology, innovation, big data. Um, but the question remains is what technology options are ethically permissible and acceptable and what is considered fair? Take 
genetically modified organisms, highly contentious, potentially game-changing technologies for some farmers. A lot of consumers and a lot of governments do not uh, want GMOs in their food supply. So not all technologies, although can be path-breaking, are acceptable. Lab-grown meats, another potentially uh, ethically uh, intractable issue. Robotics, drones, all of these technologies that are coming on to food systems need to be thought of from an ethical standpoint as well. Um, in the Eat Lancet, they looked at different technologies, technologies on farms that's shown in gray, diet, the planetary health uh, flexitarian diets in green, and food loss and waste being cut in half is shown in yellow. And they looked the contributions to reducing different environmental footprints. And you can see that the diet, a plant-based diet, has a big impact on greenhouse gases. But technologies on farm have a huge impact on other environmental indicators. That's, um, you know, more precision agriculture using less fertilizer, a better efficiency of, of, of water management, um, different uh, uh, nitrogen use efficiency, uh, recycling rates of phosphorus. So, you know, second, third generation biofuels, all of these options of technology can be quite uh, impactful on reducing environmental uh, constraints. And there's been a slew of reports over the last two months, this is by Cynthia Rosenswig and colleagues following the IPCC report, showing all of the different technologies coming out um, that have potentials to mitigate or adapt against climate change. And, and you can see some of these technologies um, are, are not such new technologies, but some of them are and are coming online. And following on that, and I know this is hard to see, and, and hopefully you all get the slides and, and I put all the references in. This is a paper that came out last month by Mario Herrero and colleagues evaluating all of these new technologies across food supplies and food systems and showing where they are, you know, from just initiation, experimental proof to implementation. And um, there's many that are already in line to be scaled out and scaled up. Um, but again, it's a matter of how do we do that? How do we build trust? How do we transform mindsets? How do we uh, change policies and regulations? How do we ensure they're acceptable and don't infringe on self liberties or justice issues? This becomes a very complex pathway in figuring out what technologies are ready uh, to transform food systems. So um, we as researchers are great at developing the technologies, testing them out, uh, seeing their uh, feasibility in the field, but we need to also be looking at acceptability and looking at some of the ethical implications. Perfect example of, of a technology that didn't do that was golden rice. Stymied for a long time because it's a GMO and it, the ethics were not considered in that. Uh, Cornell, led by Chris Barrett, uh, the Cornell University Atkin Atkinson Center for Sustainability is doing some of this work. They're looking at the technologies and, and, and assessing whether uh, these technologies are inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. So keep your eye out for the panel that's come together to look at that across industry, academia, and civil society. And policies. Policies and, and politics and political economies are critically important. No recommendation, no technology to fix food systems will stand on two legs in the current fractured and what I would call sclerotic global political environment. For us as researchers, for, for policymakers, for, for practitioners, to allow for food systems to function effectively, equitably, and sufficiently, the political environment must be one that embraces global cooperation and minimizes political polarization, geopolitical competition. We are at a strange time and we as researchers need to understand 
where the geopolitical situation of the world is right now and how we fit in. And we have to ask, why isn't there a higher priori prioritization of food system and politics? Well, there's weak institutional incentives. Um, the, the message of, of food systems is not a simple story. There's no silver bullets. They're, they're hard to measure. And there's a real imbalance of power and trust. So let me just quickly walk us through those four. Food systems require coherence across many systems. Because of that, it's a bit of a complex institutional orphan. In nutrition, we call it everybody's business and no one's responsibility. Because food systems touch upon so many elements of other policies, it becomes hard to take ownership of them. The message is also hard. We know that uh, like tobacco, tobacco was eliminating one thing. You made it hard to smoke, they taxed it, and um, they stopped advertising on it. Well, food's not like that. Food is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. There's many different products. And so it's a sticky, it's not a sticky message. It's not in your face. Um, and that often results in perpetuate inaction. For a long time, climate change was like that. It's now has some teeth behind it. But the risk of making well-intentioned but inappropriate policy choices are much smaller than the risk of using a lack of evidence as an argument for inaction. So we, as the, as the nutrition and food systems community, need to be thinking about sticky messages and, and pushing the evidence to policymakers to take action. Um, it's hard to measure food systems. They're complex, there's many factors, many elements. And we've established something called the Food Systems Dashboard. I've put the, the URL here um, that allows you to characterize, look at, measure food systems across the world. There's 170 indicators representing every country and territory in the world. Um, we have uh, indicators that cover the whole suite of food systems. And I really encourage you all to go to it and use it. And we'll be doing some pilot testing in countries. And power is a big issue. Who shapes and governs food systems? We know this hourglass shape, 1.5 billion farmers, 7.5 billion consumers, and a lot of concentration and consolidation of the food system actors in the middle of the value chain. And this has created a lot of mistrust because of historical transgressions. And we talk about that in a, a new paper that we published on why are public-private partnerships so difficult in, in the nutrition space? And there's a lot of mistrust of industry in the way they hold power in the food system. So we need to grapple with that power and rebalance and get governments to shepherd food systems in the directions that benefit their citizens. And my last two slides, change in behavior is difficult. You know, we look a lot at of consumer behavior changes. Well, if we wanna change the food system and make grand transformations, everybody's behaviors need to change from the policymaker down to the farmer and to the consumer. But behavior change incentives and nudges are, 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 are really important and they can complement the research, technology and politics. And often it's thought that behavior is not as difficult to do, but actually people do change their behavior but it can also be very, very ephemeral. So nudging is an interesting space that's gaining traction because it's less forbidding. You know, it's not regulation or I forbid you to do this. It's not paternalistic. Nudging people in different directions can be an important um, way to change behaviors. And we've seen that in the healthy eating um, area where you change the choice architecture when people walk into a, a food market, you can change um, where food is positioned, um, the size and portion sizes. There's lots of different ways to change and nudge people subliminally towards the right directions. And, and there's a, quite a significant impact on healthier consumption decisions. That's just one example. But we're going to see trade-offs. We can't have resiliency, equity, sustainability, and health for humans and planet. Governments have limited resources 
they have limited time, they have limited um, um, choices at, at their disposal. And we're going to see trade-offs. The question is, how do we deal with those trade-offs while doing the least amount of damage? And a paper by Chris Benning and colleagues that I was uh, uh, graciously a part of was looking at food system sustainability. And if you just look quickly at these trade-offs, um, you know, here's showing you trade and looking at the sustainability of food systems. And, and, and the other one is showing you uh, changes in agriculture area and, and the sustainability of food systems. We see that depending on which button you press, you're gonna have different impacts across health, environment, and economic growth and equity. So with every decision made, there's always a trade-off. So who wins and who loses? We need to be carefully considering that if we wanna make grand food transformation. And I'll end there. Thank you. Jessica, uh, Dr. Fanzo, thank you so much for this uh, extremely stimulating and uh, exciting lecture. Um, you have, uh, uh, in the end, uh, focused on, on four takeaway areas uh, in which research needs to progress. I repeat them uh, by the buzzwords. We need to build research evidence and communicate it well. Uh, secondly, the power of technology. Um, Yes, uh, but it also needs to be combined with ethical considerations and ethical discourse. Third, policies and political economy. And fourth, behavioral change. Um, dear colleagues, um, um, you are welcome to do the following now. You either send a brief question or comment into the chat function, and we will monitor that uh, uh, Jan and I will monitor that and uh, will try to prioritize a bit. There is a first point which uh, um, uh, that is uh, Lawrence Clarks um, is um, uh, making. Um, given the title of this lecture series, Innovation Pathways to Sustainability, what role, Jessica, what role do you see for the emerging field in the last 15 years of transition science, transition science, and the approaches it has generated to foster food system transformation. In uh, view of uh, um, the need to, um, for managing co-evolving social, technological, and institutional change. So um, in a nutshell, as I understand the question, where do you see the frontiers of uh, transition science and food system transformation? Um, there is so often the call on transforming the food system, but transforming it to what? And how can science in this obviously dynamic change field of transition and transformation play a key role? What type of science? Back to you, Jessica. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Lawrence. Um, you know, I think what's interesting when I think about transition science is, is the idea of, of humans and their interaction. And I think um, more and more, I think historically, and, and you can disagree with me, Professor Von Braun, but I think historically we've sort of left people out of the food systems equation, in a sense. When you look even at frameworks, there, there hasn't been a people-centered focus. And I think more and more now we're seeing and we're putting people at the center of food systems. They shape uh, food systems in the directions that they wanna go. And I think we're seeing in the science, science field of, of how humans interface and shape um, food systems and we're forced to do that because of the changes of, 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 of human um, progress and, and the migration of humans. I mean, never has there been a time where we've seen such interaction between um, humans moving from place to place and, and, and the growth of, and changes of, of, of human endeavors. So 
to me, I feel that one, one interesting progress has been putting people at the center, um, this human-based place approaches to, to, to food systems. Um, but I don't think um, overall there's been a real focus on bringing this co-evolving, as you said, the social, technological, institutional change together. Still, most donors, most researchers focus on single approaches. It's much harder to think holistically and think about the trade-offs and which buttons do you press? Do you press them all at once? Do you press, press them in, in a series? And that's really hard to do from a research perspective. It's hard to do from a policy perspective. It's hard to do from an implementation on the ground perspective. I think many of you know of the Millennium Villages Project, Jeffrey Sachs's project, which attempted to press all the buttons at once. And it was fraught with issues and contentious political uh, uh, you know, snafus. So I think um, we haven't been as good at looking at all of these different issues at the same time. It's, it's harder to do. So um, I don't know if I've completely answered your question, but I think we've put humans more at the center of these systems and how they're influencing them. But we haven't thought about the how the factors within the food system feed off of each other as well. And that's the whole area of food systems. It's the systems thinking um, that is evolving. And even now in universities, you don't see a lot of students getting trained on food systems thinking still. It's still very yeah. disciplinary, but yeah. Well, good old systems theory and analysis uh, need to be revitalized. There's a question from uh, Marta Antonelli. Uh, she asked, um, I would like to ask Dr. Fanzo, to what extent can urban food policies, urban food policies and strategies accelerate the food system transformation? Great question, uh, Marta. Um, yeah, urban, some of the urban food policies have been the most uh, forward thinking, actually. We're seeing a lot more movement on healthy and sustainable uh, food systems in urban places because of mayors. Mayors have some autonomy in places and they have some pretty forward thinking policies. So I think we're learning a lot from urban policy about how to translate that into more global policy into peri-urban hinterland rural type policies. Um, of course, the way you approach urban food systems is, is quite distinct and different from rural food systems and they have their own challenges. Um, but I think uh, there's been a lot done on urban food policy and, and many lessons are being taken from um, some standout successes in, in, in some of these urban policies. Urban agriculture is a whole nother area that I feel is um, evolving will not solve the issues of food insecurity for the world. Um, but um, some of the innovations being tried in urban, uh, urban farming um, could translate into to, uh, more technologies outside of urban places as well. But you know, some of the vertical farming and things like that are, are fascinating and interesting, but are they cost effective and can the world take them on is, is, is another question yet to be understood. Yeah, good, good. We have uh, seven additional questions and they are coming in more rapidly. Uh, so uh, let's take this one from uh, Shweta Kandelwal. Uh, what are some of the ways by which we can increase FV consumption across all sections of society? Um, so some ambitious interventions which will address pricing, acceptance, behavior change, awareness, reduce food waste, and, um, and so on. So um, um, these are lots of buttons which you, um, uh, the question ends there. My interpretation would be uh, you have uh, pushed many of these buttons. So. Um, how to, how to address them maybe simultaneously and prioritize? 
Yeah, so fruits and vegetable consumption, uh, you know, there's been um, some successful and some less successful um, ways to increase fruits and veg consumption. I mean, from, from, from the agriculture side, obviously, is changing our subsidy policies and ensuring that farmers have insurance and the ability to grow these crops. In the United States, there's no incentive to grow those crops because it requires uh, migrant workers to come and pick many of those crops and that gets into immigration policies and laws. There's a lot of food loss and waste. So how do you create, um, you know, the, the ability to be able to sell foods that maybe are not shaped perfectly. Um, so the whole subsidy schemes need to change. But of the fruits and veg that are grown around the world, you take uh, you know, places in, in the Mediterranean, you take uh, California, which is growing a lot of horticulture. Um, from the consumer side, there's uh, obviously ways to improve fruits and veg consumption. It's making it easier to, to cook it. And canned and frozen fruits and vegetables is not a bad compromise if you are not able to keep fresh foods for a long period of time because of time constraints. It's not a bad option. Um, there's really interesting programs linking the health system to, to increase fruits and vegetable consumption, like food prescription programs, where a doctor prescribes you um, discounted fruits and vegetables that you can take to a market and you purchase those at a lower uh, price. And there's been some pretty significant impacts on those food uh, prescription programs. Um, you know, the, the whole campaigns around ugly fruits, buying foods that maybe don't, aren't perfect, but um, are just as tasty and healthy and safe. And there's a lot of programs promoting um, to purchase those ugly fruits and vegetables so those don't go to waste, for example. So just a, a few examples, but it needs to be across the entire food system. And of course, those are all perishable foods. So we need the technologies, cold, cold storage, um, you know, rapid transport to be able to uh, get those foods to market without them perishing and rotting. So yeah. mm -hmm. lots of issues. Juliana Paris asks um, about COVID-19 and mm -hmm. uh, uh, learning from it. Uh, I, I, I read from the question. Um, how lessons learned from COVID-19 can help us on a more sustainable food system? And what kind of trends can you already preview, preview of how are we getting out of this, considering these main drivers of change you pointed out? So COVID-19, lessons learned, how do we get out of it? Yeah, I feel like it, Juliana, it's hard to answer that in a sense because I still feel we're in the, we're somewhere in the middle of it. Are we, in the, are we in the beginning, the middle, or the end? I have no idea. In the United States, it feels like we're at the beginning. So it's hard to talk about lessons learned, but based on that, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you what I think are four lessons. I think the first is that food systems do not operate independently. And the they engage in this complex dance of other systems. So the COVID was a shock to the health system. It is clearly a health system shock. It's an infectious disease and it's moving around. That has then had an incredible impact on the food system. So when we think about um, you know, shocks, what, a shock to one system, that being the health system, can have significant ramifications and fun on the functioning of food systems. So to me, that is a great, a great lesson that we can't think of just the food system and only focus on that. We need to think about all these systems. I would say the second thing that, that maybe is a more personal but it, it, uh, lesson that I've learned is that surprisingly governments can be very nimble and act quickly. <laughs> For years, the international development community has been pushing on agendas like poverty reduction, ending hunger, mitigating climate change with very little action and traction. And so you were, you know, I was always left with this idea that 
governments sort of wax and wane. They don't really take action very quickly. Well, COVID has shown how quickly governments can act and maybe not always in the right way, but they act, they acted, they shut down borders, they installed curfews, they created lockdowns. Um, so to me, the lesson is that when countries are faced with a significant threat to them, uh, like a very infectious disease, they will take notice and act with speed, which surprised me. So don't underestimate how quickly governments can act. The third is that in the food system specifically, food supply workforce um, has always been an undervalued segment of the workforce and they've been thrust into the spotlight with COVID. How susceptible they are um, and, and how uh, many of those in the middle of the food supply chain um, are affected by something like this, this pandemic. So it really draws attention to the missing middle of the value chain and those that keep it functioning. And I would say last is safety nets in the form of cash and food are so critical right now to the most vulnerable and the poorest smallholder farmers, food workers um, across, across uh, of all sectors actually in the pandemic. So I think these social protection program safety nets are so key and will continue to be so with the fallout of the economic uh, downturn as we move forward. So, so those are kind of four lessons that I've been thinking about with COVID. Yeah, great. Um, there's a question from Rudiger Stegemann. Rudiger asks, um, do you consider the concept of food sovereignty, food sovereignty to be a potential horizon for what is needed? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think food sovereignty makes sense for country. Well, it, it, it makes sense in theory. I think um, it doesn't always work though. Um, you know, there's, there's, I think some countries confuse uh, food sovereignty with food sufficiency. Um, I work a lot in Timor-Leste and, and, and they push a lot for food sovereignty. But Timor is not a country that um, it, it needs its neighbors. It needs its neighbors to be food secure. Um, so while empowerment and ownership of food systems uh, is, is critically important, um, we need to also understand how uh, to share this common good, that being the global food system and do so in a way that is, is, is a more just future. So like Nepal, for example, they have food sovereignty in their constitution. It's embedded in their constitution. Um, but is the government ready to support uh, what food sovereignty means for, for farmers, for food system workers? So I think in theory, it's great, but I do still feel that we need um, cooperation across borders. We do need to share ownership of the food system because it, we can't have isolated food systems. For example, with COVID, there's a lot of talk of should we move towards local food supply chains? Well, yeah, sure. If you're the United States that produces lots of different food, how do you do that if you're Malaysia and you produce palm oil? You can't have a local food. <laughs> you, can't have, you can't just eat palm oil for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, so this idea of um, you're hearing a lot about food sovereignty, local food chains, global food chains um, being quite uh, negative. I think we need to consider global, local, global cooperation, sovereign uh, situations. So I think it's not a one size fits all, but I think food sovereignty in theory is quite important. Yeah. Well, I. Let me step in with a brief comment uh, 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 on this one, Jessica. I, I very much follow and agree with what you just said, but uh, to uh, my surprise or surprise of others, recently the European Commission has received a, a report from a high level commission, which you could uh, add to your slides, um, uh, arguing for more food sovereignty by the European Union, 
which uh, I find uh, fairly far-fetched in the case of Europe. Um, but uh, it was uh, prompted by the risks related to uh, um, uh, disruptions in international trade in the context of COVID. This was just a brief comment. Uh, Hart Feuer, Hart is asking um, about uh, the issue of behavioral change, which you brought up a few times, as well as the end of, at the end of your lecture. You suggested that the food system is so compromised by concentration and middlemen, it is going to remain likely that these actors will have more power to shape behavior. Um, and um, so um, can you uh, comment mm -hmm. on, on their role and um, the role of skills serving some alternatives? Um, yeah, Hart, that's, it's, you, Heart, you're getting to the heart of matter. <laughs> the, the power imbalances, uh, it's the sort of elephant in the room. And Professor Von Braun's going to have to deal with that in the UN Food Summit. There's already some contentious issues around industry's involvement. Um, I, you know, as long as governments don't, as long as governments don't, are not sitting in the driver's seat in how they govern their food systems, there will be an imbalance. Food industry and the food sector, which do a lot of good in the world by feeding people, but they don't always do good from a public health perspective and an environmental perspective, um, will continue to feed us and feed us the way uh, it fits their business mandates, which of course is to earn profits. They answer to Wall Street. Um, that's, their, that's their stakeholder. Um, and that will continue to be an issue as long as governments don't take more action. Um, so there, there are things that governments can do to regulate industry. And we're seeing that in some places. Now, regulation is very scary to a lot of the private sector, but for some things, it could be quite powerful. Um, Chile, for example, has uh, put warning labels on food packages. They get black stop signs if the food is high in sugar, salt, and fat. Well, chili went, so, and that informs the consumer. They see it, it's on the front of the pack, it's on the label, and they can say, okay, well, I choose to buy this food even though it's high in sugar, right? But chili went one step further, and they now regulate that food. You can't advertise it when child, during the hours of prime TV watching of children. You can't sell it in a school or near a school. And what they saw, Barry Popkin and colleagues did an impact uh, um, evaluation of that program and showed that uh, the sales of those products that had the warning label went down 28% across Chile. So that's a, that is a, a government taking action that we don't want our citizens to be eating foods that are unhealthy. We're going to warn them and we're going to regulate that. But what it also caused was that private sector then reformulated those foods, tried to reduce the sugar, reduce the salt, so they didn't get the warning label. So they proactively started reformulating those foods. It's just an example of where government steps in, industry will try to um, do some voluntary measures to avoid getting um, penalized, but also Chile created some regulation. You're seeing this with taxes, soda taxes and other things, but we need more of government stepping up and saying, we want this industry, you play this way or you don't play this way. And I think for, for Professor Von Braun, the agriculture sector is a little bit more uh, willing to play in the sandbox with industry and the agri-food business than nutrition. And nutrition has specifically seen a lot of issues around breaking of breast milk substitute promotion in developing countries, pushing junk food all over the world. So the nutrition community has a lot of mistrust of this power that industry plays. But 
we can't um, pretend that they don't exist and they hold a lot of power because they do. People shop in markets every day, multi transnational companies lead this. So how do we pull them along with us to have better public health environment and profit gains so they get that triple win and there's ways to do that. Um, and and uh, maybe some of you know Lawrence Haddad, maybe you guys can get him to do a talk, but he's been thinking about ways to incentivize private sector to do the right thing and still get profits. Great. Um, here comes another interesting question. Um, um, let me preface it. Um, um, the, um, the trade-offs matter. The trade-offs also differ um, between rich and poor people mm. and rich and poor nations. Um, the question which Boran Altin Sicek is asking, Boran is asking, do you see a conflict in food systems changes coming up regarding food trade between um, low and middle income countries and higher income countries? So uh, a conflict between richer and poorer nations in the food system. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of you have followed the, the issues with the United States and China and how that had some implications across many other countries like Brazil and, and, and others on these embargoes. Um, so it just shows you, you know, two heavyweights kind of going at it and the implications for trade and um, the, what, the United States uh, White House policies on participated in, in some of these uh, regional trade uh, agreements has implications. But you know, I, trade is complex because we, we wrote a paper, maybe it was in 2018, it was in Nature Sustainability where we looked at if there was no international trade, what would be the flow of micronutrients around the world? We basically show that without trade, there'd be significant micronutrient deficiencies around the world. Right? Zinc deficiency, iron deficiency would go up significantly. So you can argue that trade allows for more diverse foods to move around the world and some of those healthy micronutrient rich foods. But we also know that trade brings about uh, unhealthy foods moving around the world. And that's really the dilemma, is, is this infiltration uh, and access to unhealthy foods. And there's been arguments about NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and how it impacted Mexico's diets. They moved from a very traditional diet, corn and bean uh, dominated diet, to much more of an American diet. Now, NAFTA is not the only thing to blame, there's other uh, factors there, but it definitely did not uh, um, help. Um, and we know that you know, there's classic examples of the South Pacific where turkey tails and mutton flaps are, are the, 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 the leftover foods that nobody wants get shipped to um, the South Pacific, which are considered really unhealthy cuts of fatty cuts of meat. Um, these are sort of these detrimental effects that we're seeing of all, you know, no holds barred type trade. Right now there's a, a really a significant piece of work coming out in Amazon showing the infiltration of Nestle and some other uh, food companies um, in pushing their you know, products on a traditional Amazon uh, region um, and the health implications of that, the obesity, uh, implications of that free trade um, and that's going across river causeways etc so trade has its positives and negatives um, it does move food around the world but it, it brings the good and the bad mm -hmm. thank you thank you um, before I progress with uh, a few other questions uh, there is a reaction from Rudiger who asked earlier about food sovereignty um, uh, and he argues there's a lot of clarification necessary to really understand this concept, social, political, and power aspects. Um, Rüdiger, uh, would you like to 
take the floor for a minute and uh, and speak to that with the understanding that you are being recorded. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think uh, food sovereignty looks uh, not so much as uh, at the global aggregates which we have been looking at uh, during the lecture. Uh, but it looks at the existing, well, I think, majority of uh, uh, peasants or food producers in the world. If you look at the numbers of uh, global population food producing, and I think there's a lot of uh, uh, structures still of self-confidence uh, uh, self, uh, and uh, thinking of taking the own decisions in, uh, to the hands and not uh, at first looking at markets and uh, uh, distribution channels, etc. I'm not pleading for uh, self-sufficiency uh, of everyone, of course not, but uh, I think uh, the global aggregates uh, are not taking enough uh, account of uh, these structures. Let's okay. take uh, uh, somewhere we had the agro-biodiversity in the presentation. Jessica, you had that, uh, I think, on one uh, 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 screen. And uh, if you look at the diversity of seeds and the right to keep it, to develop it, to exchange it, we are far away from uh, self-determination. Uh, I'm relating, for instance, also to uh, the United Nations Declaration uh, on the rights of uh, uh, people, uh, UNDROP, which uh, uh, confirms at least uh, verbally as a declaration, uh, the right to determine themselves. Uh, I stop here in okay. uh, without Thank you. further details, but I think- oh, yeah. Thank you, this was helpful and uh, let's leave it at that. Um, Thank you. Uh, I felt it uh, good that you took the floor and um, certainly have more to discuss there. Next question comes from Lisa, Lisa Bieber Freudenberger. Uh, by the way, Jessica, everyone starts with uh, applause to your lecture. Thanks for the great lecture and so on. I have not been reading these uh, applauses, uh, forgive me um, for uh, uh, time constraints. Lisa asks, increasingly food production has been decoupled from environmental and social impacts. How do you see the role of uh, international trade and what could be a way forward? Um, end of quote. Jessica, you have the floor. Hmm. That's a good question that I don't think I have the answer to. I mean, I would argue though that food production is being more and more coupled with environmental impacts. You know, I think farmers, food producers know more than anyone else how important environment and ecosystems are. And they're deeply concerned um, about the present day and the future and the risks that, that um, you know, climate related disasters potentially bring. Um, I think they more than anyone know that and are deeply concerned and, and changing practices we even see it in the livestock sector, which is a contentious sector when we think about sustainability in the United States. Ranchers are deeply worried about this issue. Um, and I think also those communities tend to have a lot of social and cultural cohesion to the land that they work or the waters that they, they interact with. So, so I think um, the, the issue of, of how trade um, that I just don't know. I don't know if I have a, a quick answer to that. Sorry about maybe, that. Maybe can I just uh, clarify yeah. a point? So it was more about, sorry, maybe I, I, I misspelled there. Um, it's more about how food consumption actually is decoupled from the environmental ah. and social impact. Sorry, that was, yeah, I typed in the question. And, 
um, okay. and and how you know because people don't see what the impacts are how much that is actually impacting the environment and also other societies they actually don't know uh, maybe how unsustainable their food choices are and it, of course international trade plays an important role there and but as you said role is the the trade is also important so uh, what could be a way forward yeah, no, I mean, the whole area of what is a healthy and sustainable diet, like what is a healthy food, what's a sustainable food, is incredibly confusing for consumers. A lot of that, you know, of course, has to do with, um, you know, researchers not communicating the evidence in a digestible way. Um, and, and media then taking it up and, and simplifying something that maybe is not so simple. I think there's that whole area of just the, the difficulty in consumers to be able to absorb what's healthy, what's sustainable, what's not. Like just take fish. What is a, health, what is a more sustainably fish, or sustainable fish, what's not? I mean, it's just, it's, or grass-fed beef versus grain-fed beef or free range chicken versus organic chicken. This is incredibly confusing space with not a lot of government regulation. Again, labeling, what does this label mean? What does that label mean? But there's also, um, there's, there's also issues that you quickly get into on the ethics side about if governments were to, to try to um, provide more information or even put a carbon tax on high carbon foods that quickly gets into uh, ethical implications, paternalism, um, justice issues. So I think there's, um, you know, when the Eat Lancet came out, I was getting death threats and people were saying I was a vegan, although I'm not, um, and saying, you know, how can you, meat is great. I've never felt better eating, a, a, you know, all meat, no carbohydrate diet. I've never felt better, right? It's this very I approach. You see, you see that a lot on social media. The, the whole idea of it's not just you anymore. You know, we are a globally connected community. What we eat is shaping not only our own health, but the health of others, the cost of that health care, the environment. So it begs the question of, do we have the right to eat wrongly? And many would argue, yes, I can eat whatever I want. And you really see that in the United States, of course. They're into their self-liberties, right? And it drives me crazy because it's this idea that what, whatever I do with my actions, it doesn't matter. It's not going to affect the rest of the world. Right? That's why I can continue to live in my big house and drive my SUV and eat hamburgers every day. Because what I do doesn't matter. And we know that we're not in that situation anymore. Collective action does matter. Um, but you still see places, particularly the United States, it's a very strange place where it's, it's, this, it's this individual action and the right to do that. And that is why the United States, some, in power, do not believe climate change is human induced. Because the minute you admit that, you have to change your behavior. And you don't want to do that, right? Because it's Dainese profits. And this is a big issue. Um, so there's the whole kind of just a confusing, muddled space where consumers don't know how to navigate. And then you quickly get into I want to eat what I want to eat because it fits my lifestyle and it doesn't matter what happens outside that lifestyle. So I think there's two kind of big issues there. Yeah. Okay. Last not least on this list, uh, I would like to um, uh, ask you or read a question to you and then turn to um, Jan Berner who may have a, a couple of points or questions and uh, maybe I add one or two and then we I think have uh, made your morning in Washington DC uh, stressful enough. <laughs> Let me ask you this one here. This comes from Hebron uh, Sibatu. Hebron 
asks uh, you to talk about gender aspects of system transformation. Uh, mention, please, a few key points uh, about the gender aspects of food system transformation. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Kibram. I, yeah, I should have mentioned it. I, I just, I didn't have so much room and I already went over my time, but there's a whole body of literature on the importance of women and, and women's empowerment, particularly because they shape and move the food system in a very dominating way. Unfortunately, they're not viewed that way in the food system, right? Women are often marginalized. Um, they don't get access to the technology, services, assets, inputs, um, business training, uh, capacity building that they deserve, um, particularly in places of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where you see women are really uh, keeping the food system thriving and alive, and they and they are essentially ignored. So, um, I think you know most uh, donors are very uh, aware of the gender issues and always ask for a gender lens uh, and gender to be a cross-cutting issue in any programming and that that. Um, is undertaken in many of these places. Whether or not that's taken seriously is another issue. But I would also argue that we're realizing more and more women are an important group that's been classically neglected in international development. But I think we're seeing a lot of others too. You know, um, there's a lot of marginalized populations, whether, again, ethnic minorities, tribes, different castes. Um, those with disabilities um, that have been left behind. And that's, you clearly saw that at the end of the Millennium Development Goal era and why the Sustainable Development Goal era called for no one being left behind. But I think that those are, that are being left behind, there's a very subtle nuance in, under, in, in counting the who's left behind. Um, and, and a question is, why have those different groups been left behind? Why are they not valued in society? And how do we give them voice and self-agency? And that includes women, it includes youth, it includes African-Americans, you know, whoever, whoever it is, marginalized tribes. So um, I think a lot of us are coming to grips with this idea, in academia even, this underrepresentation of minorities, um, that uh, they, they shape and move the food system, but they're often the most food insecure. So um, we need to ensure that they're on the agenda. Um, and hopefully that will be pushed in the UN Food Summit. And, they, and those populations will be sitting at the table, at the summit, in the front row, not the usual suspects, right? Not the typical people we see at every UN food meeting. Let's make sure that women are at the table, women farmers, women food producers, youth, African Americans, you know, pastoralists, whoever they are, fisher folk, that they are at the table with Agnes having deep conversations about how to move the food system forward. It's, it's their food system, it's their future. Yeah. Well, we are aiming in that direction, if I may say so. Good. But to bring together two things. One is some form of a people's food summit um, and an evidence-based and an evidence-informed food system summit uh, with um, the whole set of stakeholders which you mentioned. This um, may be the objective of squaring the circle, but uh, we feel that needs to be done and you need to be part of this. Jan, um, how about uh, coming in with a few points from your end, um, then I will add, and um, our distinguished uh, Professor Fanzo will have the final word. Jan? Thanks, yeah, I'm joining the applause that you received in the chat. Um, I think there are many take home messages and I'm not gonna try to synthesize them here, but one that I'm taking home for our joint endeavor here in the TRA-6 
uh, is, uh, I think what you showed us nicely um, is that there are two, at least two ways towards more sustainable food systems. One goes through technologies and one goes through institutional innovations. And we're having discussions a lot about, well, what is more important, the institutional innovations or the technological innovations? But I think um, the two must go hand in hand because uh, you showed this nice graph with the bars um, where all the technological potential was mapped out by the authors of the respective paper. But uh, the authors also say um, that, well, there must be several conditions in place for this potential to be um, realized um, and uh, in a sustainable way. So uh, the challenge really is how do we bring the, all these great new technologies together with uh, the necessary institutional innovations, uh, maybe the necessary change of values that you mentioned in response to Lisa's question um, uh, towards uh, what we believe could be a much more sustainable food system. I think that's something that uh, we will have to revisit in, in our discussions uh, internally here for the next couple of months and, and years even and see how we can uh, contribute towards, towards yeah, bringing these two aspects together. So that's, that's it from my side. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. Uh, let me add uh, one observation um, that uh, uh, relates to the subtitle of your lecture. Can we have it all? And between the lines was a resounding no. Uh, and um, for those um, who are uh, following sort of media reports on food system, there is a, a simplistic line which you have debunked. Um, there is enough food in the world, we only need to redistribute it differently. Mm. It's utter nonsense. But this um, uh, perception is uh, uh, still very strong and is there. So um, the challenge which you leave us with is uh, how do we model these trade-offs? How do we make sure that um, ethical aspects uh, are coming into play uh, in uh, um, uh, designing the food system changes and transformations in such a way that they are efficient, fair, environmentally sustainability uh, uh, leading to a healthy diet to the extent possible. Um, Jessica, back to you. And um, 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 I hope you also enjoyed being with us and this should not be the last time. Go ahead. Yes, thank you so much for, for the opportunity. And again, I'm sorry we couldn't be together in person. And just to respond to both of you, Jan, the technologies and institutions is, is, is yeah, I think you need both, right, going hand in hand, but the research, of course, underpinning that um, and informing those two processes all along the way. And, and um, to Professor Von Braun, you know, it, it's, it's looking at those trade-offs and putting those, uh, the suite of trade-offs in front of someone, because there will be trade-offs. And the question is, is what are we willing to live with? And what is a policymaker having those trade-offs in hand going to decide on? And to me, what gets at the crux of that is what kind of a policymaker do you want to be deciding on those trade-offs? We're learning a hard lesson. Germany's learned hard lessons in the past. We're, le we're learning hard lessons about policymakers that choose the wrong trade-off, <laughs> right? And are choosing the wrong trade-offs. So, I mean, it's a lot of this, again, is getting all of us involved in policy processes as researchers who can bring the evidence to bear. Um, and never has there been more, a, a more important time to, to strengthen numbers as, is, is pushing the evidence as hard as we can. Um, so the, the most sound and thoughtful decisions are made by the kind of policymakers that we want to lead. Um, lead in the world. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, well we, leave, we believe in the power of evidence, but we also believe in the power of elections and voting. Exactly. <laughs> Let me leave it at that and thank you wholeheartedly for your brilliant lecture and um, uh, 
we'll be in touch uh, uh, bilaterally and with probably many who have uh, been fascinated by your talk today. Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you all and stay healthy. All of you. Take care.